In 2004, Nintendo would gift us with the release of the Nintendo DS. This console would not only become the highest selling handheld of all time, minus the Switch, but a device almost every child wanted to have. Games like Pokemon Soul Silver and Animal Crossing would dominate the market like no other. AAA titles like these would get attention, leaving smaller releases doomed to go unnoticed. And while some of these games are considered classics, a certain genre didn't get the attention it deserved. DS's small library of survival horror. And no, we're not talking about Resident Evil Deadly Silence, but two games that stand out from the rest games that I would consider one of the fundamental reasons I got into horror, and ones that I consider near and dear to my heart. After spending nearly a decade trying to come across and obtain these games again, I finally have them. And those titles are Dementium 1 and 2. In 2007, development company Renegade Kid was founded by Greg Hargrove and Jules Watcham. The two originally strived to turn their day jobs into something more. And with their love for the DS, they were fortunate enough to raise funds to start their company. Renegade would go on to produce a handful of DS games, like Moon, Zeo Drifter, and Mutant Buds. Unfortunately, the doors to Renegade Kid would close forever in 2017. Only two years later, Greg Hargrove would pass away from cancer, leaving a hole in the team that couldn't be replaced. The very first game that this company would go on to develop was 2007's Dementium The Ward. A considered classic, being the first game in their developing journey is impressive. It's like these devs said they were gonna put their foot in the door and you're gonna like it. I just want to give Jules a big thank you for being nice enough to answer a few of my questions that were left unanswered about the development of this game. So. Thank you once again. Jules had mentioned to me that Dementium's production officially started in 2006. That's just one year prior to its original release. Bob Ives would also join as a programmer for the game and would permanently stay for Renegade's lifetime. Jules said that he had a strong vision for this game and with Bob and Greg's help, they were able to achieve that vision. The main inspiration for this game would be Silent Hill 2 and Doom 3. Silent Hill 2 is known for its amazing ambience and scary monsters, while Doom 3 is known for its cool first person shooting and fast paced action. The team was lucky enough to secure a meeting with popular publisher Konami. The meeting, however, went like this. They were kind enough to meet with us, but the meeting only lasted a few minutes and ended with their representative saying they wouldn't let a team like us handle a Silent Hill license. Damn, Konami was harsh. They'd rather make pachinko machines instead, I guess. Even though they were rejected, that didn't stop the team from making the game they were going to make. The first name for this game would be The Ward, shown on one of the beta title screens as well as a mock-up cover. The team's main focus was to build a so-called tense atmosphere. During this, the team was able to discover that this game could run at 60 frames per second. That's something that even today's modern games can't do. And man, did that 60 FPS work well. The team was able to create an effect that allowed the fog and flashlight effects to look seemingly perfect in a classic looking PS1 style. The game was already starting to shine before its release. It would hit store shelves on Halloween of 2007, selling over 100,000 units. Absolutely incredible. Dementium the Ward follows a man named William Redmore. William suffers from amnesia, so when waking up in Redmore Hospital, he has absolutely no clue on what's going on. When it couldn't get any worse, the dark corridors are filled with monsters that haunt the hospital. William must make his way through fighting enemies left and right if he wants to make it out alive. This is a jam-packed DS game. 
that features a chapter-based style, with a total of 16 chapters. I'd like to point out that the chapters are pretty short, which means that the game itself isn't very long. It only has a runtime of about 3 hours. A second playthrough would take the player half that time to beat. There is a story present in this game, however the gameplay clearly outweighs it greatly. And not in a 60-40 way, but a 90-10 way. I was hoping that this game would eventually fill some type of gap in the story, but it never does so. Assuming that the DS couldn't handle cutscenes and fast gameplay, I would prefer good mechanics than a story that can only hold itself up halfway. You see, this is one of the reasons why I can't see a lot of resemblance from a game like Silent Hill 2, the game that's all about storytelling. The ward only captures its ambience. You start off with a key and a notepad. Why did you do it? The front page reads, alluding to the scary horror we'll uncover. An aspect that I like about this game is its darkness. You can't see what's in front of you until you get closer to it. This effect would be known as low draw distance. William does start with a flashlight, however you can only equip one item at a time. Do you favor lights or defending yourself? This is easily a reference to Doom 3, and the fact that you can only equip one item at a time as well. It comes as no surprise, the game plays similarly to a first person shooter. There's no controller in sight, which means your most powerful weapon is your stylus. Without it, you're pretty much helpless. Similar to Silent Hill, there are red squares that allow you to save throughout the game. On the DS's bottom screen, you have a Resident Evil looking inventory, with all of your weapons plus your health status and extra items. Another main feature in this game is the notepad I mentioned earlier. It allows the player to take down notes or any information you feel is worth saving. Choosing not to write codes you might need is an issue that can arise but backtracking will always be a thing. I had mentioned the flashlight before, but now I want to talk a little bit more about that. As the team hired Bob Ives for programming, they absolutely loved his 3D mesh engine. And from there, that's when the atmosphere and vibes were coming into fruition. Jules had this idea of making the flashlight an extremely big part of the game. It needed to be done right. That was the only way this game could work. Well, it worked absolutely perfectly. The effect worked by cutting through the fog with a mask, creating an illusion to the flashlight doing something when it really isn't. If you choose to stare at the flashlight for a few minutes, you'll see the illusion start to break. Don't ruin it for yourself. The style of gameplay reminds me of the Wii and its motion controls. The stylus being the control in question. In order to look around or aim in the direction you want to go, you simply move your stylus to your heart's desire. If you're a scaredy cat, I could see players wanting to either throw the stylus or maybe move it around in random directions, as it's very easy to do both those things. Guess what's even scarier? Killing enemies. Your first weapon is your flashlight, and your actual actual one is a police baton. The baton forces you to get up close and personal with the enemies if you want to fight them off. Close-up combat weapons like this one can be a little janky in terms of hitboxes and accuracy, but trust me, I've seen way worse. The problem, however, is easily solved when you get a handgun. The handgun is a great early weapon as you get used to the game's mechanics. The handgun lets you start attacking enemies from afar, and even though they are far, they do require more bullets to fully put down making it scary when they run closer and closer. After this, you do get a pretty large selection of weapons, ranging from an electric buzzsaw to a damn sniper rifle. There isn't a million weapons to choose from, but I honestly respect the diversity that's handed to us. I'll personally suggest further range weapons on this one. Before we move on, I'd like to note the awesome implementation of 3D audio in this game. When you're aiming or walking or hearing where enemies might be in the room you just entered, the 3D audio is telling you to take advantage of it to stay alive. In today's time, horror enthusiasts would call this game a smash indie hit. Popular games like Murder House and Iron Lung use the advantage of old, blocky, and blurry graphics to make the game feel scarier, 
and that's because they do. A game like Silent Hill has a very uncanny feeling to it, especially when you can't really see or even understand what you're actually fighting. The locations, the characters, the voice acting, it's all uncanny. And man, it's scarier than before. Graphical limitations or not, that unrendered blocky atmosphere is one of a kind. Yeah, some might argue it looks outdated, but this is a horror game, it gets a pass. On the other hand, the location plus the blocky experience gets a little repetitive at times. It feels like I'm walking around in circles and the map will only help if I open it up each time I go through a new door. The locations do venture outside, but for the majority, it's mainly indoors with reused assets that get tiring at times. While the hospital section was purposely made the main location due to Jules believing it matched the game's identity the best, I would have loved to either see more colors or even more standout areas. I think this would have made the layout a little less confusing and more enjoyable, especially towards the middle and end of the game. While a game like Silent Hill 2's hospital sequence was a big portion of the gameplay, each corridor somehow felt different, with that hint of color when James sees a neon sign or when he's trying to pull something out of a bathroom clog. Ambiguous details make a dull room shine. There is no urge to explore only when you're forced to so you can solve a puzzle. What's a horror game without puzzles? I know that over the years, puzzles in horror games have been lost to time, even though they should be considered one of the core fundamentals. Yes, developers, I am interested in spending 45 minutes on a puzzle, only to realize the answer is the riddle spelled backwards, thank you. Dementium has some favorable puzzles. Some might be simple, but they allow the player to easily overthink them. I'm referring to the first puzzle, a piano piece. The wall reads, dead. And funnily enough, that's the answer, D-E-A-D. -E Play those notes on a piano and you get your prize. I personally love this approach because us horror gamers are so used to reading into things when it's like, duh, obviously. Through time, puzzles do get more elaborate. An example of this being a riddle to count the dead man's eyes in order to unlock a safe for a shotgun. One of the standouts for me is the puzzle in chapter 7. You find a note that has a list on it. What the puzzle is making you do, however, is look at your surroundings and count how many of each item is in the room. From there, you'll get a code you're looking for. Attention to detail. The ward's music is subtle but impactful. Most of the time, background music is playing. The most notable areas that music plays are during boss fights. The soundtrack reeks with an 8-bit style choice. The sounds are particularly tense, which brings your focus more on the music than the game itself. You better pay close attention. I don't know if I would consider the soundtrack as a certified classic, but I'd be remiss to not mention how the soundtrack does excel at what it needs to do, which is keeping the player tense at all times. How fun is it that we've made it to enemies and bosses? Yes. It's very fun, be excited. There isn't a ton of enemies in this game, even though a lot of the same ones show up in each level. First up, we got Chess Maws, AKA Freaks. These are your basic level entry enemies that have those big teeth in the middle of their chest. These guys spawn quite often and you can usually tell where they are by their creepy breathing. There's another version of these guys that spit green gook at you, kind of like the line figures in Silent Hill 2. They're not that hard to kill and can usually down them in a couple of hits as long as they're not spawning in multiples. Molluscas are another common enemy of which I find very annoying. They're fast and small, resembling a worm. They not only come in packs of four to six, but spawn together with chess maws in the same room. I usually just run past all of these enemies cause finding health items around the map is pretty easy. Molluscas are mainly on the floor after coming out of vents. Maybe they were babies in the incubators at one point? Critters just crit around, don't worry about them. Banshees, aka screamers, have a set of lungs, even though they're only a head. These flying enemies usually come out when there is a long hallway in proximity. Their screams get old real quick, and if you don't kill them quick enough, you may receive a headache. 
I will say that they're probably one of my favorite character designs given their cool tongues and hair as wings. Flying swarm are flies that fly in a swarm. They like light, which of course is not good for you, but they aren't attracted to gunshots, which is better. Of course, you can't have a horror game without some type of bug in any form being somewhere. Crawlers are other enemies that resemble a chest maw. The only difference is that crawlers have no legs. They crawl! Ha! They spit out acid, so it's best to steer clear of them. I have saved a section particularly for bosses. There are only four bosses in this game. I don't think that's bad for a short game, as long as they're spaced out right. The first boss is named the Cleaver. I quickly realized he resembled Pinky, one of the demons in Doom 3. Pretty cool touch, intentional or not. Not gonna lie, I was pretty stumped on this boss. I kept dying and was trying to figure out what I was doing wrong. You come to learn that you need a little strategy to beat each boss. In this case, sticking to a wall while simultaneously shooting him in the head speeds up that process very quickly. A cute little boss fight that gives the player more of a challenge from what they've seen so far. Now this next boss is interesting. You're fighting someone called the wheelchair. No joke, you're literally fighting a man in a wheelchair. Well, I don't know if I would even call this a man anymore. He has a gas mask on and a Gatling gun as a hand. You can decide. This boss is much easier than I expected it to be. You simply shoot him before he makes his attacks or follow him around. You can pretty much kill him quickly after that. While his design is great, I would have hoped for a little more in his boss fight. You do see the cleaver and the wheelchair man again, but it's almost the same interaction. The Maw Room is our next boss. This room is absorbing, only because it's a room where you fight off molluscas primarily, then occasionally shooting the actual enemies, which are walls? Very interesting choice for a boss battle. This kind of reminds me of that one and only boss battle in Silent Hill 4 when you have to fight the wall monsters. All I know is that I was not expecting something like a room for a boss, but sure, creativity at its finest. The final boss, the Doctor, is the big boss battle. After going through some final enemy corridors. Some have argued the doctor is extremely overpowered because of his attack moves, resulting in your character becoming immobile for a brief period, causing you to take a severe amount of damage. Let me pause for a second though, because strategy here is key. As long as you're able to hit his attacks centered around his hands, he will be stunned, which will cancel his attack. After that, he's simple to destroy. After this battle, you transport to a cutscene, which shows William waking up in a hospital, only this time, the normal hospital. Oh wow, was it really just a dream? No, it wasn't, because seconds later we see William somewhere else getting his brain experimented on by the doctor? Apparently passing phase one? So that means that the only real thing that happened was the doctor being a real person? Man, I... <laughs> I don't know, but that's how it ends. Short and simple and credits rolling. Ah, an overall solid arcade like game that might lack in the story department, but is pretty fun to pass nonetheless. Hey, what's up guys? How's it going? Uh, thanks for coming by. Um, Dementium 2, our new game has been announced uh, yesterday, uh, May 29th, Friday. Today is Saturday, the 30th. Um, so yeah, we're doing Dimension 2. How cool is that? Uh, we sent out pamphlets to uh, a bunch of people in the media, which you may have seen maybe some news pieces on. Jules announces that Dementium 2 is officially gonna be a thing. I can't imagine the excitement the team feels after finding out their second game is going to be released. Another score for horror, and something the fans can be excited for. From what we could see, the cover to this game is forever ingrained into my head. This cover is just phenomenal. Imagine going to the DS section with your parents only to see this plastered on the shelf. A must purchase, right? I know. What am I waiting for? We are talking about Dementium 2. The game starts off almost exactly like the first game. This is amazing already. We are playing as William yet again. 
How? I don't know. It's phase two of his treatment, I'm guessing. Off the bat, I can already see many improvements in just a short amount of time. For starters, the graphics look clearer and nicer. Even with a subtle graphical enhancement, they still managed to keep that original style featured in the first game. We'll talk about that more later. Also, already a lot of dialogue and it sounds so clear. Oh man, I'm loving this. Looks good. Do you know your name? It's William. William Redmore? You've had brain surgery. You've been out for almost five weeks. You're better now. Everything's gonna be okay. The guards coming in? This looks like a possible new enemy. After waking up in this hospital and getting to your cell, everything becomes a trance of horror in a flash. You leave your cell and seconds later you're picking up a shank for a weapon. The first person view with the shank reminded me a lot of a PS2 game called The Suffering. I mean, it's pretty darn similar. After this you fight your first enemy, a chess maw. This time around, chess maws do feature different characteristics compared to its counterparts. They now have these metal infused like bodies that either take up their legs or arms. Sorry, I'll mention the suffering again, but these chess maw models do feature some similarities between that game's monsters and their design. On the bottom screen, we now have a whole bunch of new improvements. First being the absence of two health bars. Now we only see the circles like before, still changing color if your health depletes. We have the map on the bottom, which is great. No longer having to go back and forth to know where I'm going. You can appreciate such minor details that change up the gameplay drastically. Thought I was done? Nope. There is now a jump and crouch feature. This is another one up for gameplay, considering that this is a first person game too. More ways to fight, more ways to play. After escaping this trance, you teleport back to the real world hospital. The only problem being that you've escaped and now you have a damn shank in your hand. One of the new enemies in this game are guards. I find it funny that when you attack them with a shank, it makes a punching sound that we won't question. Another new feature is the ability to walk faster by double clicking the d-pad. Trust me, it makes a difference. Through notes, we learn that William has been transferred for being criminally insane. Items like an adrenaline syringe helps you with boss battles or purely your motor functions. Puzzles are back no doubt, and while the first one is just a small little challenge, it is great for a first start nonetheless. These things, they, they all started happening after your surgery. Whatever was wrong inside your head, we, we let it out. God help us all. It's apparent that after the first game, as they were doing surgery on William, whatever in his head must have been let out. Wait, does that mean that it wasn't a dream after all? Is this just in his head again? Is this just phase two of the project? Ugh, there's so many questions. You fight your first boss maybe five minutes into the game? They're throwing in the fire quick with this one. Yes, you can defeat this boss with solely a shank. I wonder why the enemies spawn in by appearing out of an orange circle. Interesting choice. I do feel like this takes out of the immersion a bit. We'll touch back on this. I'd like to start off by highlighting locations. Man, is there a difference. The settings are just so much cooler to look at. I feel like I'm in a maze and really just want to look around. We've upgraded to things like outside snow cabins, underground tunnels, tight industrial corridors, even some awesome and immersive rooms you have to fight a boss in. The improvement is here and it shows. It really just felt like a breath of fresh air. If you were hoping for more of a story on the second entry, I'm sorry to inform you that a story is also mainly absent throughout the game. Honestly, as expected. I didn't think a story would expand that much because why? I'd prefer other factors, for instance, better gameplay and locations than a story. Remember, this is not a Silent Hill. It's just a first person silly little horror. The doctor is the main antagonist again, taunting William throughout the game through a speaker or something.
We move on to the game's gameplay. Well, I've already spoken about the drastic changes to the bottom of the screen, so we got that out of the way. In terms of gameplay mechanics, everything else seems very similar. There are only 5 chapters now instead of 16, each chapter being the equivalent of 3 war chapters. You look around quickly, you shoot or hit, and you have your stylus as the backbone of the game. The game doesn't feel boxy like before. Losing the closed space for a more explorative one is something I hope to see this time around. But you want to learn about something even crazier than that? The addition of holding 2 items at once. The first game banked on the fact that you could only hold one one item at a time. Now you can't always do flashlight x weapon if your weapon is needed with two hands, but you can with smaller ones. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, there aren't that many reused assets in terms of weapons, yet another shining star for this game. There were appearances from the flashlight, no surprise, and the buzzsaw out of all things. New additions include the default shank, a fancier shank aka the powerful dagger, a six shooter revolver, a strong sledgehammer, a double barrel shotgun, assault rifle, flamethrower, dynamite, a boomerang ancient relic, and a nail gun. Chances are your favorite weapons are going to be that shank so you can combo it with a flashlight or a sledgehammer to break things and do extreme damage when you need to. There does feel like a lot more enemies have been placed along the map, so I could understand the two holding item change. Or easy way out, whichever you prefer to say it. I know I mentioned the jumping feature already, but I'm happy to say how intertwined it is with the gameplay. Jumping off buildings or jumping over walls. It made each chapter more enticing. Escaping from an enemy? Just jump! Since we are already going to move on to enemies, something I didn't like is how enemies spawn. I mentioned that they come from a circle. But I didn't say how the game locks you in said area until you kill a certain amount of enemies. This usually happens during these trance sequences, which come at random points in the game. I think these little sequences took out of the immersion. They felt like little mini games that I'm forced to do. The term for these parts are the planes of anguish. I suggest saving when you can. Your health gets restored, which is always a plus. One part I thought we'd get more of was puzzles. We did see a few, but not as many as I had hoped to see. I think that more complex puzzles would have gave this game the classic survival horror element. Most were codes that aren't the worst, it's better than nothing. Something similar to that piano puzzle we saw in the first game could have been neat. The 8-bit style of music makes a comeback. However, it's even better this time. The the songs felt a little more groovy and I caught myself getting a little too in tune at times. While there is a main theme that follows you around, a lot of the music tied in nicely with the environments that were being shown on screen. As far as a big highlight for this game, it easily has to be awarded to the enemies and bosses. So let's discuss. We start off with the Gna, the first boss battle in the game. Gna has a big ass mouth with the skinniest arms and legs you'll ever see in a character design. It's actually kind of funny the more you look at him. He has chains on his head, and you'll notice that recurring theme throughout the rest of the enemies. This is the boss battle I mentioned earlier, with only having a shank to fight. You'll be fine, trust me, just get up close and personal and slash him up. Many enemies make a reappearance such as banshees, molluscas, flying swarms, critters, and chessmaws. In addition to that, there are a boatload of new enemies included this time around. I'm impressed they managed to fit all of these into the game. We have a plethora of enemies, such as little brain enemies that follow you around. These black abyss areas that suck you in and force you to fight chess maws if you run into them. There are slime mines, which already look like they're gonna bust, with chains covering their appearance. They can explode and hurt your health, so watch out for them. These spitter enemies goo and giggle at you while doing so. It's humorous, to the point where I feel like this enemy enjoyed being killed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Aerial hunters are supposed to have buzz saws on their bottoms. It's quite hard to see with the way the graphics look. These enemies are slow, so easy to kill. When you do kill them, they release little sluggers out for you to kill too. One last hoorah. Whalers are basically banshees, with an added defense mechanism to attack the player. Oh yeah, and they wail. Reanimators can reanimate after being killed. Wow, that name is very much spot on. Kill these completely with a flamethrower. Their interesting appearance needs to be terminated. All right. We're making progress. Let's continue to the bosses. I think this next one is my favorite. It's an extremely dark and foggy area. You sense a monster, but you can't see it. This boss is titled Wendigo Witch, a great name that fits perfectly with her character design. She uses the tactic of luring her prey in by pretending to be someone else. In this case, William's wife. You have to be on high alert this whole battle because she can burst out at you at any time. If you're able to dodge her attacks and hit her each time she lunges out, she'll be dead in no time. The next boss is the Gorgamesh. He doesn't have chains, but he does have barbed wire. He is a more yossified cleaver. It's undetermined whether this is a boss fight or not. He doesn't have a health meter. He'd be better classified as a stronger common enemy that just so happens to be really big. Colossus is an awesome looking character. He gives me cartoonish vibes, but in a very creepy way. This fatty is slow, and dynamite is its kryptonite. That and killing him by shank would probably lead to a quick death. This boss has you going through obstacles, simultaneously fighting Colossus. Talk about ingenuity at its finest. I absolutely loved what they did here. You can simply just run away and kill him. So how can we make it even harder for the player? Add killing machines so you can run away. The very last boss you fight is a penis. Okay, this guy is a giant worm. This thing is all mouth, and you guessed it, all chains too. Malatessa can spit fireballs at you. How classy. There's an orange circle that indicates where this giant will come out of. Kinda defeats the tense factors, but we move. You kill the final boss, and thank God that you don't have to let it out to the world. The ending to this game is very short and abrupt. Just take a look. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is William becoming the doctor, then he died? The doctor still has power over William even a game later? Without a long length game, D1 and 2 weren't able to flesh out a great story. Watching a story unfold on such a little screen maybe wouldn't have been so fun. A Dementium 3 on the PS5 with a fleshed out story could be a chef's kiss of a project. Maybe that will come true one day. We can only hope. Overall, Dementium 2 is a far better game that outshines the first, and makes so many changes to improve its predecessor's gameplay. This game has a charm to it even to this day. There's nothing like opening your DS, putting the cartridge in, and whipping out that stylus. As we make it to the end of the video, we opened up both games pretty much in their entirety, talking everything there really is to know. And I highly suggest trying both of these games out. Appreciate what a group of three people can do. A passion project that was fortunate enough to have everything work out in their favor. Devs like Watchem, who plays his games and connects with his fans, are people that we can use more in the gaming industry. While the gameplay might not be revolutionary to you now, back then on the DS, this was pretty groundbreaking. Stay for the vibes, the nostalgia. I can't imagine what it's like losing a partner, let alone a friend. But just know his legacy will go on, no matter where Renegade Kid is.